Come on, Transformation Nation, make some noise. No, I said if you really love Jesus, you ought to praise God. Do me a favor, look at your neighbor, say neighbor. In the comment, I want in the chat, type neighbor. I'm expecting something big from God. Now praise him like something big has your name on it. Hear me when I say this, there's no place on the planet like Transformation Church. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I firmly believe what God is doing in this season. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered the hearts of men. The great thing God has in store for not just this church, but for Transformation Nation. I mean this. Call me crazy. Call me crazy. But you have not because you act not. I believe the atmosphere is already set. Whatever you're believing God for, put it in the comments right now. Whatever you're believing God for, do me a favor. In the room, just tell somebody next to you what you're believing God for right now. Let me help you. Jobs and better jobs. Raises and bonuses. Sales and commission. My family will be saved. My children will be healed. This city will be blessed. God's doing what eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. And he's doing it right now. And it's gonna be. Somebody just shout big, big, big. I mean it. I am so honored to Pastor Mike and Natalie Todd. I mean it's from the bottom of my heart. Old age, civility, and humility demand that I say publicly what I have often expressed privately. And that is one of the greatest gifts to the body of Christ that God has given us is housed in the person of Pastor Michael Todd. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe when God wanted the people that he could call his own, he sent Jesus. I believe that when he wanted Chicago to win six championships, he called Michael Jordan. I believe when he wanted music to go to another level, he called Michael Jackson. And I believe when the world needed to arise and awaken and represent the gospel, he called Michael Todd. And I just want to celebrate him. If you love your pastor, can you clap your hands right there, man? Yeah, man. Do me a favor. If you're at home, if you're in the room, just jump on your feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, our answer is yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, our answer is yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, our answer is yes. Yes to your will, yes to your word, yes to your way. Our answer is simply yes. And all those who agree with me say it. Amen. Okay, so I, I want to teach today. Go to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 4 through 6. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 4 through 6. My assignment is not to come to transformation and preach my favorite sermon. No, my assignment is not to come to transformation and try to say something that would go viral so I can get five or 6,000 followers. My assignment when I come to transformation is to reinforce that which the man of God has set in place so we can become not just a bigger church but bigger people i don't think you heard what i just said and i want you to see hear this when i say this so i want to come from an obscure passage today thank you so much caleb i want to come from an obscure passage ezekiel chapter 16 verses 4 through 6 once you got it just shout i got it on the day you were born no one cared about you your umbilical cord was not cut and you were never washed, rubbed with salt, or wrapped in a cloth. Jesus. No one had the slightest interest in you. No one pitied you or cared for you. On the day you were born, you were unwanted, dumped in a field, and left to die. I feel a little church on verse 6. But I came by, and I saw you there, helplessly kicking about in your own blood. And as you lay there... I said, somebody type, somebody shout, live. Live. It was Elbert Hubbard who said, and I quote, when God looks you over, 
He won't look you over for medals, diplomas, nor degrees, but rather for scars. We've assembled at Transformation a week from Easter, not just to celebrate the resurrection, but to also take a moment and honor the crucifixion. Because the problem with the 21st century church is everybody wants to live, but nobody wants to die. When it's not until you've been through some stuff, survived some stuff, and live to tell the tale that God is a good God, not just because he kept me, but he's a good God even when I'm going through things that I do not choose to go through. Because I've understood in my life that most people want purpose, but most people don't want pain. And when it comes to purpose and pain, the two aren't mutually exclusive. You can't have one without the other. And Albert Hubbard in this quote says something that forever changed my life. He said, when God looks you over, he won't look you over for medals, diplomas, nor degrees, but rather for scars. And that one word messed me up, scars. Somebody say scars. Got scars. Scars, and please don't shout this early in the message, is proof that you survived. Scars are the proof that what used to wound you you have now gotten over and see the reason so many people are being set free and healed and delivered and inspired by transformation church is that we are a church that are unashamed to show our scars i don't know who i'm preaching to in here but you're looking at me early in this little message of mine like you've always had it together and you've always made the right decisions and you've always been on the front row of the church. But is there anybody at Transformation online or in the room who can say, don't get it twisted, I've been through some stuff. Survived some stuff, but I can stand and shout, I'm still here. Why PMJ? And this may be why people can't figure you out because the truth of the matter is when they know who you used to be, juxtaposed to who you are right now, they can't figure out why would God do all he's doing for you? Look at your neighbor and say, because I got the scars to prove it. I have the scars to prove can't nobody do you like Jesus. I have the scars to prove that even if you fall way down, he'll come and pick you up. I have the scars to prove it. Scars are a beautiful thing. This is why after he was crucified, after he was resurrected, the disciples are sitting in a random room trying to figure out what to do next. And the text says Jesus comes walking through the door. Now that's enough to tell grandmama's church up. New school church, you got to properly harmonize your hermeneutics with relevant homiletics, building a bridge of contemporization from the original audience to now. But at grandmama church, they just got it out the gate. The disciples have heard and got news that he's been killed and they don't know what to do next. They're sitting in a room and the text says Jesus comes walking through the door. You missed what I just said. And when he gets through the door, see that's for three of y'all who feel like life has you boxed in. God does not have to knock. That, that's enough to mess three people up. He doesn't have to wait on you to let him in. He can just walk. Okay, let me help you. My, my friend, Pastor Beavers, taught me that there are three types of doors that you have to encounter. The first door is a manual door. It is a door that, you had, that requires effort from you. You put your hand on the knob. You either pull or you push. That's the door that requires effort. And many of us are frustrated, irritated, and aggravated because it feels like every door we've been trying to open for ourselves has been taking all of the effort from us. But, but God says there's a second door that is a revolving door. Now, this door is crazy because it requires no effort, but it does require timing. Michael, it, it does not require effort, but it does require timing because the revolving door does the work for you. But if you miss timing, you end up going in circles. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but the last six months of your life, You've been going through some unnecessary circles. And God is saying, I've already made a way. You got to make sure you get in my. So there is a 
physical door. There is a revolving door. Don't shout. Get it together. They invited you back. Do not embarrass yourself. Be dignified. Preach like you got some sense. But I'm used to shouting. You bet not run in this church. The third door is an automatic door. Jesus. The third door does not require effort and it does not require timing. All you got to do is show up. Can I preach to somebody at Transformation Nation and declare the reason anxiety, depression, and frustration has been on you so heavy because the devil knows in this season, all you got to do is show up. I need a hundred people to praise God because this is the year that I am about to show. Somebody type, show up, show up. Look at your neighbor, say, show up. I know you're not qualified, but apply anyway. Show up. I know your credit may not look like it, but show up. I believe when you show up, God will show. They, <laughs> they, 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 they're in this room and God walks through the door, right? He walks through the door and what he does is shows them his scars. How do we know it's really you? If you're really Jesus, how do we know it's you? And he says, in order to validate, thank you God, the authenticity of who I am, I'm not gonna read you my resume. I'm not gonna testify of how I fed two fish, 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. I'm not gonna remind you of all your personal issues because if I was Jesus, when I walked through the door and the first time the disciples asked me if it was really me, I would have looked at Peter and said, ain't you the one who cussed? Ain't you the one who sat at dinner at Starbucks and told me you would never leave me and you gonna cut somebody from me? Then when life got there, boy, Thomas, you really don't? I would have been reading them, but Jesus says it don't take all that. He says he showed them his scars. Now, here's what messed me up. Here's what messed me up because I have a scar on my arm for when I jumped off a trampoline when I was a kid, and that scar now is now whole. It was a womb, but it is now a scar, which means it no longer hurts. You can no longer see inside of my arm. You can just see what was, and you can tell that it's healed. But the difference between my scar and Jesus' scar is that he never closed it. My, my, my God. No. He, he shows him the holes in his hands. And I was tripping like, God, why wouldn't you fix it? Versus allowing it to remain how it was. Because he said, Michael, I wanted to show them that I'm not over it. It never affected. I'm not even going to mess with you on that one. He said, so when God looks you over, he won't look you over for medals, diplomas, nor degrees, but rather he will look you over for scars. And when we tiptoe into the corridors of today's text, we find ourselves situated and acculturated in Ezekiel. Ooh, Ezekiel was a cold-blooded text, especially coming off of Easter. Why, PMJ? Because we talk about the resurrection, but we breeze over the existential reality of the crucifixion. See, that's my only frustration with Easter. We are so ready to shout that he got up that we forget the fact that we, he went down. And his death was proof that he was human. His resurrection was proof that he was God. And if the only thing we do as a body of Christ is shout about his resurrection, yeah. when you have human moments, you're going to always feel inadequate. Yeah. Jesus, he said, I want you to see not only can you get up, but you're also strong enough to maintain when you go down. And when we tiptoe into Ezekiel chapter 16, it shows us God's great compassion for his people, even though they were unfaithful. You learned this, or maybe you didn't, as you matriculated through Sunday School 101. The people of God are in trouble again. They are in trouble again because they've been unfaithful. They are in trouble for four reasons. Number one, in chapter 12, they're stubborn. In chapters 13 and 14, they listen to false prophets. In chapter 15, they're deemed useless. So by chapter 16, they have a history of being unfaithful. 
Michael, can I preach four chapters in four minutes? Chapter 12, they become stubborn. Chapter 13, 14, they listen to false prophets. Chapter 15, they are deemed useless. Chapter 16, they may have a lifestyle of rejection. And don't sit in here and look at me like you ain't never had a chapter 12 season in your life. Please don't sit on this line and sit in this service and act like you ain't never been in a season of being stubborn. Don't do that. Don't act like God ain't never woke you up out your sleep and told you to pray. He, you heard the Lord. Get on your knees right now and talk to me. And then all of a sudden, you so stubborn, you try to compromise with God and pray while still in bed. Just stubborn. Don't act like God ain't never told you to let something go, but you were not done being mad yourself. So now you in the car negotiating with God, like, I'm not going to give them. I didn't do nothing wrong. And God's saying, be godly. No, no, I'm not stubborn. And the definition of stubborn is having or showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something. Now, I'm going to say that slow, and I need you to screenshot this and really put this in your notes. The, the, the definition of stubborn is having or showing dog determination to not change. Every word matters. All right? So for this one, I'm not even going to deal with the attitude. It's one position. Jesus. If here is holy... Stubbornness can keep you from here. Preach me. So, so, so what happens is, and I really want you to catch this. He says it, it, it's the refusal to change your attitude in spite of good reasons to do so. And I wonder who's watching me right now who's so stubborn that you won't come out of something. And God is saying, I've given you every reason to do so. How many times I got to keep you in perfect peace when you keep choosing chaos and you won't come out of it? How many times I got to deliver you from something only for you to walk right back into it? And might I submit to somebody in here that one of the greatest battles, the worst thing that God has done for some of us is been good. I'm going to say it again. The worst thing that God has done for some of us it's been good. God has been so good to you for so long that you now think it's you and not him. Michael. <laughs> and, and you become stubborn. And God told me to tell you my issue with you is not the fact that you fail. You're human. We all fall short of the glory of God. My issue is not that you had a bad week. See, the problem is not that you've been weak. The problem is the difference between being weak and being wicked. There's a difference between being weak and being wicked. Weak means I had a bad moment. Wicked means it's now become a lifestyle. And it's hard for here to be holy when you're wicked instead of being. And they become stubborn. So in chapter 12, they become stubborn. Chapters 13, 14, they listen to false prophets. Now, can you put this in your notes or maybe tweet this or screenshot this? If Satan can talk angels out of heaven, he can talk you into hell. I'm going to say that again. If Satan can talk angels out of heaven, he can talk you into hell. And might I submit to some of you that God has already given you the word and the affirmation you need to become what God has called you to be. But you're waiting on affirmation. You want to know what I discovered in my life? So many times in my life, God would speak to me and give me confirmation on what I should do next. But the problem was I knew me. Only three people going to say amen to that. See, the problem was I heard God say join. I heard God say leave. I heard God say speak. I heard God say stay. But the problem was because I knew me. And I didn't feel qualified because I knew my mess. I would then try to find somebody who looked like they were living better to give me confirmation because I didn't trust that God would speak to somebody like me. Michael. When God is saying, I am no respecter of person. In your mess, 
th that was a boy by the name of Prodigal. We, we don't know his name. We're just going to call him Prodigal. He abandons his father. He lives a reckless lifestyle. He is now in a pig's pen, and he came to his senses. He, he came to his senses. Might I submit to somebody who's watching right now that no matter where you find yourself, God can speak to you. Yeah. That, that I thank God for a ministry that, that has enough love and enough heart to help people who are incarcerated because behind a prison wall, God can speak to you. I, I, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but if you've ever been at your lowest point, but you got a word from God, you want to know why I miss old school church? See, old school church, they did things, try, try not to go to sleep on this part, called revivals. Now, now, now you, you, you too young to know what a revival is. Don't front. You know about conferences. No, back in the day, we had five night revivals. Who remember that? So on the first night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but then Friday would be the big night, all right? And I never forget growing up, I would always tell my grandmama, why we got to go every night if it's five nights? Why you just won't? Pick a night. And she said, Mike, I don't know what night. I'm going to get the word that can change everything. Now, I don't know who I'm preaching to, and I don't know what you're going through, but I got a simple message that may bless you. One word from God can change everything. And I don't know who I'm preaching to in here, but is there anybody in the chat or in the back who can testify that the reason I still got half of mine left is because when I came to transformation, one word from God changed my entire situation. Somebody shout one word. There, there was a woman who was bent over and she came to church. And Jesus looks at this woman in the back and says, come, mm. one, one word. You would think that if he saw she was bent over, body doubled. The Bible says her body was broke and her spirit was broke. You would think if Jesus, who's the alpha and the omega, knew this, he would save her the trouble by going to her. But Jesus says, I want to prove a point. If she can struggle to get to me. You should be able to run to get to me. And hear me. And this sister has to take her time. Her back's hurting. Her legs are tired. She's frustrated. She probably had to take a break. And can't you see folk in church who's sitting in the front because they paid good money? who's sitting in the front because they knew somebody and they doing all this extra stuff to get his attention. Then all of a sudden, Jesus looked past the pretenders. Because one thing we've discovered is you can front like you want it, but your spirit will demand it. And Jesus looked past the pretenders and says, you, I, I don't know who this is for, but I want to speak by faith over the next three weeks. God's about to give you a you. Yeah, you didn't shout because you don't know what that means. See, when God says you, okay, that, that means that he's getting ready to select somebody for supernatural favor. And I know you're frustrated because you may not have the pedigree or the finances, but God said, uh, 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 you. And I want to speak, favor is about to find you. Grace is about to flow to you. Get ready for God to do exceeding, abundant, above all. Somebody look down your row and shout, you. Says, says, you. And can't you see her? Yeah. Caleb, give me some cinematic movie. Caleb. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. And can't you see the haters on the first and the second row? It reminds me of David, how he was in the field working. And his own family didn't think he was good enough. Then the prophet says, no, go get him. Here it is. I'll wait. And I came to prophesy to somebody that you may not have got there when they got there. 
But God says, I love you enough to wait on you. I love you enough to stay right here until your season comes. And he says, watch this now. She was not stubborn. Had she been stubborn, she would have said, what I'm going to walk up there for? This ain't my first service. That woman with the issue of blood wasn't stubborn. She has spent all she had all she had trying to get healed then she hears that Jesus is passing by what if she would have sat at home and said I'm not spending another dime I'm not going to see another fake prophet I'm not going to another church service don't miss your breakthrough being stubborn they're listening to false prophets and what happens PMJ because they're listening to false prophets verse chapter 12 stubborn 13, 14 false prophets. Chapter 15, they're deemed useless. Now, you want to know I discovered? You do not fall instantly. Your fall is somewhat progressive. If there is progressive sanctification, there should also be progressive deterioration. Okay? Progressive sanctification means I'm not who I need to be, but I'm also not who I used to be. But I'm a whole lot better that this is the idea of transformation that we are progressing. Yeah. That, that means each day I'm getting just a little bit yeah. better. Oh, you, you don't want to shout because you're progressing. All right, let, let me give you the real hot, uh, transparent people of integrity version of, of progressing. Now, I, I won't cuss you all the way out, but I may cuss you. I, I'm, I'm, please, Michael, be patient with me. God, how do you know you're progressing? Because I can sing here is holy and then 20 minutes later in the parking lot if you come at me the wrong way. So if there is something called progressive sanctification, we must also understand progressive deterioration. Progressive deterioration is when you fall slowly. No, it's when you miss one stream that turns into two streams, that turns into one month, that turns into four months. And before you know, you want to know why I like streaming so much sometimes better than in person? Because when people missed church back in the day, there was this pressure to come back to church because I was worried about who was going to look at me for being missing. See, but the blessing of being virtual is that even if I missed, I can tap back in. So by 15, he says, no, you are useless by 16 they now have a resume of rejecting God he says no I, my, my issue with you is not the fact that you fail my issue with you if you're looking at me from wherever you are right now my issue is not the fact that you fell down my issue is not the fact that that you had a season in your life where you fell lower than you ever fell God is sending me here to tell you my issue with you is not the fact that you fell down my issue is the fact that you stayed down God said, I put something in you that should make you mm, get up. Mm. See, I, I'm not preaching to everybody, but you want to know one of the strongest qualities you got that you sleep on? It's how many times you found the strength to get up. See, reach over that neighbor and just high five another neighbor because you sat next to an undercover hater who don't understand how many times you had to get up. Somebody ought to put in the chat right there, I keep getting back up. Can I preach to somebody who the truth of the matter is, if I'm talking to you, if I'm not talking to you, you can just sit there. But if I am talking to you, you ought to jump up. I still don't know how I got up out of some of the stuff. Look down your row and say, God anointed you to get up. Look at somebody else, shout, God anointed you to get up. Look at him and shout, get up. You know what I discovered? Revelation says we are freed by the blood of the Lamb and by the testimony, the word of the testimony. And one of the things we have to put back in church, which is why transformation is such a cold-blooded church, bro. Y'all don't even be realizing how they be killing the game, all right? I ain't talking about just version two. I'm not talking about just dropping music. I'm not talking about arenas and sold-out conference. I'm talking about how they can remain fly and still do testimony service. 
See, y'all missed that. See, because back in the day, testimony service was so slow. Praise the Lord, saints. I said, praise the Lord, saints. Well, you know, I didn't have enough money for my medicine. And this arm right here been hurting a whole lot. Then I went down there to the, I went down there to that little, the little market right there and didn't have enough money. Didn't have enough money. Then I went down there to that little market right there and then, then, then I, I, I did my pockets just like this. I didn't have no money. You know what that, you know what that doctor said to me? Don't even worry about it. And the whole church would start running because you knew if God did it for them, he could do it for me too. I need somebody to be a testimony that God saved my family, he can save your family. God cleaned up my house, he can clean your house. Somebody shall testify. testify. That's why when that beautiful sister came on the stream and she said, no, she said, I used to get high just to watch church. See, them the type of testimonies. I like, I need testimony and a little tea. I, I don't need these cute testimonies. Somebody ought to put that in the comments. I need tea and testimony. Tea and praise the Lord, saints. Yeah, I was smoking a little weed about two days ago, and I was on YouTube watching battle raps. And I, I love how Loso and Saga was killing it, right? So Loso was dropping bars, and Saga was killing it. Then all of a sudden, an ad came up, and I saw this guy say, What's up, man? This is Pastor Mike, and you never believe. And so I'm high, right? I'm high. And he just coming through the screen, and I'm like, Whoa. So I clicked it. So I'm watching him. He's all over the place. Eh? He's doing all this. And all of a sudden, yeah, I've been saved six months now, man. See, because if God... Do me a favor. I need you to put the camera on the crowd. If you are a living, walking testimony, I want you to praise God like he's doing it, not just for you, but for everybody connected. Somebody shout, get up. Somebody shout, get up. You've been down long enough. You've been frustrated long enough. You've been depressed long enough. Millions didn't make it, but you're one of the ones who did. Look down your row and shout, get up. Hear me. Easter, Easter is not just about Jesus getting up. That's my issue with the 21st century preacher. It's not the fact that we preach an inaccurate gospel. We pre preach an incomplete gospel. Jesus, don't kill me in the chat. He didn't just get up. Had Jesus only got up, you would still be bound. Michael, had Jesus just got up, you would still be bound. He didn't just get up. He came out. You missed that. That's why he said death. Oh, grave. See, it was two fights happening. He said, one, I'm going to go put hands on death. But after I put hands on death, grave think they're going to have me. Watch this. Because grave was smarter than death. Grave put a stone. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. This is not on the notes. I need you to put this in your notes. This is what my professors at Yale call uh, 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 theomusis, on the spot revelation, okay? All right, because in this text, in, in that story of the resurrection, I see two E's, existence and exit. Jesus, existence and exit. He says, I'm going to kill death because I'm fighting for existence. I'm going to kill the grave because they're blocking my exit. You want to know why some of y'all keep going through the same cycle? Because you killed what was trying to kill you. The problem is you just stayed in it. You didn't come out of it. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but this is your season to not just get up. You ought to type and shout, come out. Oh, Hear me. I know what it's like. I'm not being funny. I, I, I know what it's like. I wrestle with anxiety. I wrestle with anxiety in a very real way. Depression sometimes gets me to the point where my mom and dad have to come to the house. And I'm not talking about in the past, I'm talking about now. 
that sometimes I, I start reading comments when I shouldn't read it and, and, and I deal with anxiety. Can I sing like them? Can I, can I preach like them? I, I, I'm picked up a little weight. Do, do I need to lose more weight? I, I, I'm wrestled with anxiety because the devil will always try to get. See, the devil knows he can't stop you, but he can't impact how you see you. Jesus. So, so, so sometimes I, I wrestle. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. That this ain't to beat you up, church. This to pick you up, church, right? I, I wrestle when anxiety. The night I want artists of the year was probably the lowest night of my life. We went out that night and we went and got something to eat and everybody was having a good time. Then when I got home by myself, I just kept having these thoughts of what's next. And now, now what are you going to do? Well, maybe God allowed you to accomplish all you're accomplishing so young because you don't have a lot of time on earth left. So I start thinking about stuff like that. And now I'm just finding my myself wrestling in my head how you gonna stand up there and preach and you struggling see 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 you don't preach because you're just over it you preach because you're overcoming it am I preaching to anybody and I'm here to tell you I had to get up but I didn't just have to get up I had to come out now, I, I always argue in my preaching. If you ever hear me preach, it sounds like I'm almost arguing what I just said, okay? Because I just told you to get up. Somebody shout, get up. That felt good. But then I also told you to come out. But, but, but I'm also reminded, Jesus says, I want to teach you a very uh, intense lesson. He says, when it was my turn, I came out the grave. He said, but don't forget when I showed up for Lazarus. <laughs> Watch this. I told the very people who were mourning, move that stone. So Jesus had a stone rolled away. Lazarus had a stone rolled away. What's the difference, PMJ? Jesus came out. Lazarus came out. Only difference is Jesus stands at the, at the tomb and calls Lazarus out. I'm going to preach to this this side. I caught you, girl. I'm going to preach to this side, okay? Because I want to free you. Once you come out, what the devil will do, this is why the lady said, the woman whom you love, you remember that? The woman whom, this is good, the woman, the, Lazarus, your brother, the one in whom you love is sick. Did you catch that? Because what the devil will do once you come out is try to find somebody who pulls on your heart to get you to walk back in. Have you ever stopped to consider, have you ever stopped to consider that when Jesus got Lazarus out the grave, he never went in it? Jesus said, I'm, I'm, oh my. It's, called, it's called a Greek process called kenosis. See, what he did was, he said, I'm going to empty myself of my deity, wrap it in humanity and call it flesh. Now I'm not half God, half man. I'm all God, all man. Because I need to be man enough to feel it, but then God enough to heal it. He, he, he says, watch this. So he says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm gonna do. If I'm all God, all man, I could have easily walked in a grave. But if I walk in that grave, I am now teaching you a principle that you're going to try to walk in, but may not be strong enough to operate in. Uh-oh. I, I, no amens right here. Because all oils ain't created equal. <laughs> I'm at the wrong church track. All oils aren't created equal. This is why there are people who keep trying to mimic what you do, but can't produce at the level you produce because all oils ain't created equal. And he says, Lazarus, come out. Come out. We see a, we see a principle. And I'm going to stop. We see a principle of people who had they been stubborn, they would have missed God. Had they been stubborn. So when we tiptoe to chapter 12, they're stubborn. Chapter 13, 14, they're listening to false prophets. Chapter 15, they're deemed useless. Chapter 16, their spiritual credit is now in the mud. Because now they have a lifestyle of rejection. And here's what I like happened. In this particular text, most people don't preach it. It is the longest single prophetic message in the book of Ezekiel. 63 verses. Six being the number of man on the sixth day he made man. Three being the signature of God. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Whenever you see threes as the signature of God, on the third day he got up, Abraham was walking, but on the third day he saw where to sacrifice him. Six being the number of man, three being the signature of God. 63 verses. He said, I'm about to sign off on my rebuke of man. This critical. So 63 verses, right? And he, what does he do? This is beginning with a revelation formula in 16.1. It follows logically after the declaration of uselessness. Now, here's 
What I like about this scripture, I never gave y'all my topic, did I? I never gave y'all my topic. If Pastor Todd said this year here is holy, I came to say I'm here to remind you. Here to remind you. Because what happens in Ezekiel is what some of you guys need to hear because so much favor has found you. He says, I done brought you out of captivity. I done flipped your life. I done turned you in the air. I answered every prayer that you prayed. Then all of a sudden in chapter 12, you're going to get stubborn. Chapter 13, 14, you're going to be listening to false prophets. Chapter 15, you won't do nothing I ask you. Chapter 16, you said it is what it is. And here's what happened. So this is why when you see them in chapter 16, he don't play with it. It's one of the most graphic prophecies you'll ever read. He said, on the day you were born. Nobody wanted you. You would never rub with salt. Once you were born, then nobody cared about you. Your umbilical cord wasn't cut. You would never wash. You would never rub with salt. You would never wrap in a cloth. Now that I think about it, verse 5, God, I want you, I never, nobody wanted you. Nobody cared about you. You was in your own blood. Pause. I want to parenthetically digress because the Holy Spirit told me to tell some of you that you keep, you, you keep confusing weakness for meekness. Weakness ain't meekness. No, no, I'm saved, not soft. Don't get the two mixed up. No, 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 because there are certain people, there are certain people that the grace, watch this, not their grace with God, but their grace with you has run out. Yeah, I like Ezekiel because Ezekiel says, no, nah, let's stop playing the game. In chapter 12, when you were stubborn, see, stubborn, uh, stubborn suggests there's a war, a tug of war. Stubborn suggests I'm trying, but you ain't coming. Or I'm saying, come on, get out of that. But you, so I, I struggle with you in 12. I'm speaking. Think, I want you to think critically. In 13, 14, they listened to false prophets, which means there were options. Drinking from the toilet don't justify being thirsty. <laughs> and see, what I've discovered is the 21st century Christian really doesn't want a word that's convicting. They really just want to hear somebody pacify or affirm what they want to do. So what we really want to do is live any kind of way. Then log on on Sunday and somebody say, but God still loves you. The Lord giveth. <laughs> hear me. And he says, no, I gave you a chance to come out. I gave you a chance to fix your motives. I gave you a chance to get right. So let me come here and remind you. On the day you were born, did nobody want you. You were never rubbed with salt. You were never. And see, be careful because there's some people you need to remind. Because ain't it crazy how you were an essential part of them coming out of what they're in and going to another level. Now they treat you like an option. No, no, it's a couple of people. I might not get invited back for this. But, but it's a couple of people this year. You have to say, hey, how you doing? Can, you got enough time to FaceTime? Yeah, I got enough. Thank you so much. Hey, how you doing? You doing all right? Let me go ahead and remind you. Do you remember when you didn't even have a car and couldn't even get to church? And I would have to drive cross town. Do you remember where you were? when? Because sometimes you got to remind people where you found them. He said, hey, come, 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 come. On the day you were born. Did nobody want you? You were never washed. You were never rubbed with salt. Now, every word in the text means something. Born. Somebody say born. born. This is what's critical. This is what's critical. He's frustrated with them now. I got to be contextual with my last 10 or 12 minutes, okay? Or I won't be able to sleep at night. He's not just mad because they're living wrong. See, that's, that's a simplistic view. He's not just mad because they're living wrong. His real issue with them is that they produce bile fruit. Jesus Christ. He says, no, 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 no. I'm frustrated now. Not that you didn't produce, but what you did produce was toxic. Okay. Okay. I, I, grew, I grew up in the hood, right? I grew up in the hood, right? The house next to us had plums and a pear tree. Okay. Plum and a pear tree. And the lady was sort of mean. And she would always say, stay out of our yard. And my mom would sit me and my brother down and say, hey, I'm finna leave. Do not go in that lady yard. All right. So I couldn't take it one day. I, I was like, man, I'm finna get me one of them plums, man. I, they were just looking good. And it, it, it was on the ground. I was like, oh my God. So I never forget. She would come in the backyard and she would water her little tree. Then she would give all her cats some food and all that stuff. Then she would walk back in. And I said, okay, the way she walk she not gonna be able to turn around fast enough 
to catch me. I'm looking out the window. The moment the door closed, me and my baby brother jumped the fence. Boom. You would have thought we hit a lick. Like, you would have thought we was robbing Fort Knox, okay? We jumped across the fence, and I'm snatching plums down, and I'm throwing D, catch, catch D, catch D, put it in the back. Go, 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 go. And we run in the house, and we run in our room, and we close the door, and we breathe. Then we put it under the bed, right? We put it under the bed. We put it under the bed. It was okay. My mama, go, go to work tomorrow. We're going to eat these plums, okay? Because we knew we couldn't eat them, and my mama asked where they come from. So the next day, she come to work. Only problem is, we forgot we stole them. Okay? Three, four days later, I'm like, go get the plums. We go get the plums, and I rush them off, and I'm getting ready to bite the plum, right? Then something said, look at the back. On the back was these little holes. And I was like, I can't eat that one. So then I looked at the other one. It kind of had a little hole on the bottom. So I'm like, uh, what's going on? Then my dad walks in. He said, y'all, when did that lady? I said, I, said, I said, dad, I just wanted some plums. He said, well, give me one for your mama. Come home. Okay? <laughs> give me one. So then my dad gets in and he looks. He says, ah, baby, you can't eat these. I said, why? He said, they rotten. He said, he said oh, i never forget this. He said, you had a certain time to pick it and a certain time to eat it. Watch this. Before life got it. And see, I, I want to take the road less traveled. I want to take the road less traveled. I want to speak to somebody who's watching me right now who the truth of the matter is there was a season of your life where you were open to hear the word of God. You were open to be all God called you to be, but you had people who didn't pick it at the right season. He says, I'm frustrated because your fruit is filed. And here's what I've been wrestling with. Here's what I've been wrestling with, with all God's been doing in my life. I've been saying, okay, God, the church is growing. My music career is going. My, my, my boys are starting on the football team. All this stuff is going good. And the Holy Spirit said, examine your fruit. Yeah. Watch this. Because more people don't mean more God. More awards don't mean more God. Can, 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 you, can you put this in your notes? Put this in your notes. God will never... Use external things to produce internal change. Michael, God will never use external things to produce internal change. Let me free you. God will never give you a car to change your heart. God will never send you a job with more money to change your heart. See, transformation is an inside job. Ooh. And what he says is, he says, my issue with y'all is not that you haven't been producing. What you've been producing is toxic. Can I ask you a question? As saved as you are, as on fire as you are, as motivated and committed as you are, if I was to examine your fruit, is it toxic? See, the goal ain't you being healthy. It's us being healthy. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he says on the day you were born, nobody wanted you. Now, the preacher in me made me examine the day they were born. And, and I discovered that when I look at their father and their mother, I see an anthropological duality. Anthropological, anthropology, the study of man. Within you are two people. Within you are two people. Make that make sense, PMJ. It's called an anthropological duality. You remember the story of the man who was at the gate, at the pool? Yeah. At, at, at the pool? And, and Jesus walks up on him and says... Do you wish to be made whole? Right. Then the Bible says something that everybody missed. It said, the sick man answered. Why would the scripture say, the sick man answered? Because within that man is an anthropological duality. There's a saved you and a sick you. Yeah. Michael, look at your name and say, it's two of y'all in there. I can see it already. It's the save you, Michael. I'm at the wrong church already. I'm at the wrong church already. It's the save you and the sick you. This is why the scripture said the sick man answered. Had I not, had he not wanted me to put emphasis on him being the sick man who answered, he would have called him sick man throughout the whole scripture. At this particular part, he like gives him an adjective that can preach. He says the sick man answered, which means if I'm not careful, there are certain seasons of my life where the saved me don't speak quick enough. Michael, because within you is the saved you and the sick you, which is why you needed transformation because you was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, which means when I found my church home, it strengthened the saved me because the truth of the matter is the sick me is still in there. 
So he says, on the day you were born, I want you to catch this now. His father was an Amorite, mother a Hittite. That's critical. Father Amorite, mother Hittite. You didn't shout. Amorite means semi-nomadic. Hittite is empire flourishing. So his father, the baby's father, is a roamer. His mama is reigning. And I came to preach to somebody that there are two types of individuals inside of you. A reigner and a roamer. There's a side of you that's a queen and you know it. But then there's another side of you, if you ain't careful, the Roman you will come out. This is too good. This is too good. This is why This is why when you go to brunch after church today, when you go to brunch after church today, and you and your girlfriends or you and your partner see somebody you used to date, and they look at you and say, you dated them? Just look back at them and say, I, I was Roman. <laughs> yeah. When people, who, when people who used to know you, know you see you now and you're the main one saying, will you be my guest at Transformation? And they look at you and say, how do you know you are a serial roamer? When people look at you and say, I just can't believe God is using you. Because within you is your mama and your daddy. The daddy is semi-nomadic, which means he roams. Mama is raining and I want to submit to you that if you ain't careful you got to have enough sense to know how to remain a rainer I don't know who I'm preaching to in here but I may have church all by my lonesome right here because death and life lie in the power of your tongue you have not because you ask not I can declare a thing and it shall be so I just want to go ahead and prophesy over my own self look at your neighbor and tell him you can speak it if you believe it you ought to look at everybody in your house and say if you believe it speak it for yourself but as for me you ought to receive this this is my season to reign you ought to just shout, this is my season to reign. I'm not that old and I'm not that young, but this is my season for God to do exceeding and abundant. Above all I could ask, think, dream, or imagine, somebody shout rain. That's the wrong somebody. Shout rain. You miss your shout. Shout rain. You miss your shout. Shout rain. Okay, you, you didn't shout because I want to help you, and I'm going to stop. I want to help you. Most people miss the authenticity and the power of the prophetic word because they don't understand the etymology of words. Yeah, so, so when I told you, I feel real good now. I, I, when I told you to reign, you thought about reigning singular. But anybody who has an English degree understand there's such thing as homographs and homophones. Homographs look the same. Homophones sound the same, okay? So, so rain is a homophone. What does that mean, PMJ? It's R-E-I-G-N, which means it's your season. But it's also R-A-I-N, which means overflow is coming. I don't know who I'm preaching to in here, but God told me to tell you for the next 60 seconds, I dare you to praise God for rain, whichever one you need. Somebody ought to shout rain. You ought to put rain in the comments. It's my season and overflow. Somebody shout overflow. Yeah. Do me a favor. I want you to prove you're not a hater. Look at your neighbor and fix their crown, please. Look at your neighbor and fix their crown. Tell them fix your crown. It may not look like it. It may not feel like it. You may not believe it, but get ready to reign, baby. Get ready to be the king he called you, to be the queen he called you. You ought to shout, reign! I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I want you to fix your walk in 2022. I want you to fix your walk in 2022. Don't walk in another room like you ain't supposed to be in there. I want you to walk in like God sent me here. I wish I had somebody at Transformation crazy enough to start walking right now. Because I'm practicing how I'm walking in my new office. I'm practicing how I'm walking in my next season. I'm practicing how I'm walking in my overflow. I'm practicing how I'm walking in my new house. You ought to shout, rain!
Yeah. It's a home. Yeah. It's a homophone. Yeah. Rain. First rain, it's my season. Second rain, overflow. All right. Overflow, okay? Overflow. You, you missed it. Overflow. God says, because you're in the right place at the right time, not only am I deeming it your season, but I'm about to reign in your life. Now, now, now here's what's crazy. The only people who hate rain are people who don't have seed in the ground. My backyard gets mushy. My backyard gets mushy. It starts raining before I came here. My boy said, ugh. I said, what's wrong? We're not going to be able to go outside and run routes, Dad, because the backyard going to turn into mud. I'm like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I get ready to walk out the door. My neighbor got a rain jacket on <laughs> doing her little rain dance. I said, what's going on? She said, it's been so hot and so muggy. You see these little dead spots right here? We needed this. So, so then Xander got this look on his face. Like, what you mean we needed this? And, and I, I said, baby boy, I'm so sorry. I said, I'm so sorry. You trying to play. She planted. I, I said, so you mad because you can't go play. She excited because it's something she put in the earth. That requires God to do something. I don't know who I'm preaching to. But if you got seed in the ground, I want you to take the next 30 seconds and praise God for supernatural increase. Rain on us, breathe on us, shower down, shower down, send your spirit, Lord. Rain on us. It's a it's a homophone. Just like you missed what your pastor told you. You missed it. You, you missed it. He come here. You, you, can you come here? Yeah, you. Come here, come here. I don't think they caught it. Come, come here, bro. Come, come here, bro. Come here, come here, come here. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. All right, you ready? Here is holy. Here is holy. What you gonna do? Okay, hold on, hold on. Did you see how he was here? But the word said here. But then he was connected to people who said, hey, you better get over. Because what God is getting ready to do in your life, you either going to be one or two things. Either you going to help somebody get to their here. Or you're going to have to not be stubborn enough to live here. Here is holy. Let me show you. Let me show you. But the scripture says, on the day you were born, nobody helped you. Nobody helped you. So I tell you what, close your eyes. I'm going to change where here is, okay? I'm going to change where here is, okay? All right, you ready? Yeah. Okay, so do me a favor. Now, now find you here. You can open your eyes. Find you here. Find. I want to speak that we are about to normalize encouraging, assisting, and helping people. I bind the spirit of jealousy. I bind the spirit of pride that God is raising a generation of people who will help people get to there. Watch it. But it's a homophone. It's a homophone. You missed it. You missed it. What's your name? Say it again. Dev. Dev. Here is holy. You got it? Hey. Here is money.
Ah. You heard here and started moving. Here requires a finish. Your pastor didn't say here. He said here is holy. And the devil is slick. Why do you think Judas sounds so much like Judah? He's slick. He knew a generation of people would come up who would praise. So he made praise and pride look alike. Judah, Judas. Did you catch that? Hey, here is wholeness and opportunities. You're not moving. Okay, wait. Yeah, come on. You good. Come, you good. Trust me, you good. Trust me. Boy, if you don't get over here, I know. Boy, come on. You waiting to get married? You waiting on a wife, right? But look, she bad. And she not into that church stuff, but whatever you want, I, she'll do it. She'll do it. Hey, hey. But it's a homophone. Can I free you? I'm, and I'm finna sit down. You ready? Here is holy. Here is holy. You thought that's all God was gonna do. Watch this. Here is holy. Watch this. Here. 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 He good. Here. You good. He good. He good. He good. Because when I discovered, you know what I discovered? If I'm in the place called holy, what God blesses me with in this place is protected. So watch this. Here is holy. I want you to stay right there. Don't move. And he says, on the day you were born. So this is all it is. And I'm going to show you. This is all it is. They had got so far from God. And God was saying, hey, come on. Come on. Come on. What you listening? Come on. Will you please get out? I ain't, life coaching is not the same as transformational teaching. So those quotes are cute. But, and all of a sudden, God said, I want to be very clear. The day you were born, didn't nobody want you. You would never rush with salt. If I had time, I would break down what that means. You would never rub with salt. They believed in ancient times rubbing babies with salt or, or natron would purify the skin. They would purify the skin to protect the part of the body that people saw. Some of y'all don't even realize you've already been covered in salt. This is why you don't look like what you've been through. He said, on the day you were born, nobody rubbed you with salt. Nobody, your umbilical cord was not cut. I got a problem with that scripture though, because if he found me in a field, my mama should have been connected to me. If the umbilical cord is not cut, my mother should have been connected to me too. But what they were really saying was, no, 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 no. It was cut. It was just never cut off of you. So, so many of us are frustrated because I'm, I'm, I'm tripping past the mic because my mama had to love me. Why you think your mama loved you? Because when she ate, I ate. No, 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 you missed it. She was not feeding you. She was feeding her. But because you were in her, you ate by default. Many of you have assessed your relationships in the wrong season. You thought because they did for you, they cared for you. When you didn't realize sometimes you got a blessing because you was just left. That, that, that's going to hit you Friday. Don't even worry. But Pastor Mike, they, they said they love me. No, they love what? He says, the day you were born, nobody cared. Can I translate that? If you don't get back to here, because here, now, that would make so much sense, but it's not accurate. It's not accurate. Because somebody who's watching right now saying, Pastor Mike, I'm trying to get back to here, but I'm just so far away. Can I be honest? I'm so far away. Can I free you real quickly? It says your umbilical cord was not cut. Nobody cared about you. You were all out of the will of God. But then verse 6 says, here it is, but I came by. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I want to speak by faith. God's getting ready to come by. If you don't think it's power and God coming by, you better ask Bartimaeus. If you don't think it's power and God coming by, you better ask the woman at the well. If you don't think it's power and Jesus coming by, you better ask the woman with the issue of blood. Said, I came by and I said to you, live. 
to those watching right now, and I'm about to sit down, you had no idea that live is a homograph. Homophones sound the same. Homographs look the same. Through a whole pandemic, you didn't lose your mind because you thought you was watching Transformation Live. You missed what I just said. Because live looks just like you had no idea that Pastor Mike and Transformation's preaching team was preaching before you ever heard a word. They said, join us, live. If you're watching all over the world right now, you're watching us not just live. You're watching people that when you saw... When you saw Caleb singing, Here is Holy, you were listening live, but the level of anointing he was singing with was become because he's learned how to, man, I've come that you may have life and have it more. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm here to remind them that it's because of you we live, move, and have our being. It's because of you. We didn't lose our mind in what we were in. God, today we don't ask you for anything. We just simply thank you for everything. That if you don't do anything else, you have already done enough. God, somebody needs you to come into their heart right now. So, Father God, I stretch my hand toward them and along with all of these intercessors in this room, we lift up a heavenly language, God. We pray right now. Do me a special favor, Jesus. Come by. I don't know where you're watching from, but I dare you to put your city or your state in the comment and every place represented. I need somebody in the comment to just shout, he's coming by. That's what I love so much about God. He, he's omnipresent. He's here. He's there. He's everywhere. All we don't have to get in line. I know we said that growing up. I'm next in line for a breakthrough. I'm next in line for a miracle. A line denotes he can only do it one at a time. My God can bless everybody at the same time. So God, I ask that you come by. I ask that you do the impossible. I ask God that you intervene. Step into this situation. Father, in the name of Jesus, our answer is yes. Our answer is yes. As I get ready to bring up pastors, one of our staff pastors, I want to say this to you. There was a woman who had the job interview of a lifetime. She put on a black business suit and a white blouse. She stepped off the plane into a limo. But she began to get so overwhelmed with the enormity of the opportunity that her nose began to bleed. She pressed the button and she told the driver, if you don't mind, can you take me by my hotel room first? I can't show up to this interview looking like this. She runs upstairs into her room and she gets another blouse out the bag and she begins to iron it. And at that very moment, it's when the Twin Towers were knocked down on 9-11. For three days, she had no phone service, no reception. Her mother, who knew the last thing she said to her was, I was headed to the 50th floor. They began to plan a funeral. Everybody assumed she was dead. On the third day, I'm sorry, but it's something about that third day. On the third day, while her mother was planning the funeral, the phone rang. Phone rang, and she said, hello. And she said, mama. And her mother just started screaming. She said, baby, we're planning your funeral. We thought you were dead. Last time I talked to you, you were headed to your interview. That building was gone. What happened? She said, mama, I was headed to that building. I got so nervous that I looked down and my blouse was covered in blood. She said, mama, had I not been covered in blood, I would have died that day. And I want to submit to somebody who's watching right now that I see a dichotomy that we cannot miss. Because the person in this text is covered in blood. The only problem is they're covered in their own blood. But there is some blood. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood. If you're watching right now, I want you to text SAVED 
to 828282. Eight being the number of new beginnings. Two being the number of witness. Three eights, three signature of God. Your new beginning. We will bear witness to the new beginning that God declares and desires to do in your life. Wherever you are, I want to break the website today. If you don't know Jesus, I want you to text SAVED right now. If you know Jesus and you need a fresh start because you moved from your here, I want you to text right now. I want you to go out and live a transformed life. Can we praise God for true transformation? Come on, church. Come on. Can we praise God for true transformation?